Thank you all for being here. Uh, there's a lot of people. As I was walking up here, I saw the door, and I was wondering, it's my last chance. I could still run out, but I, <laughs> I'm committed now. I'm up here. Um, I don't want to get too sappy about it, but I do want to say one thing. So I'm at the end of my three-month residence here, and it's my first time at the KITP. Um, and I have had a blast, um, you know, from the interactions with the scientists to the, to the help of the host here to the incredible residence that does everything that I think you guys wanted it to do. Um, and I will say one thing, which is that I come from a background in geophysics, and one reason I came here for this program, I'm part of the Physics of Dense Suspensions program, was actually to learn more and dive deeper into the fundamental physics behind the problems that I work on. So I work on problems of erosion and deposition in landscapes. And I'm trying to borrow a lot of concepts that are emerging out of um, the physics community. And I decided for my sabbatical that a really great thing for me to do would be to act like a student again and come and hang out with all these physicists on the basic physics side and sort of leave my geophysical world behind. And six days after I arrived, um, the Montecito mudslides happened. Um, and the reason why this guy, um, Tom Dunn, is up here, um, he's a colleague of mine. He works here at UC Santa Barbara in the Bren School. And he is an extraordinary geomorphologist, meaning somebody that studies landscapes and how they evolve. He lives in Montecito. And soon after the mudslides happened, as soon as he and his wife could gain access, they started going up there and trying to figure out where the mud had come from, where the boulders were, how it had moved through the system. And um, I then, in talking with Tom, originally wanted to go up there with him mostly as a, um, as a tourist, because I'd never been so close to something so devastating that had happened recently. Um, and we soon realized that there were a lot of scientific questions that really, in some way or another, were connected to the fundamental physics problems that were being worked on here in the program that I'm a part of and that the evidence, of course, is being erased day by day because people need to get back to living here, right? But all of the deposits of mud and all of the boulders and all of the channels are slowly but surely, you know, all that evidence is being eradicated so we can return this place to a neighborhood. And so um, an unexpected thing that's happened on my sabbatical is I find myself doing field work pretty regularly, which I didn't expect to do while here, and I've been doing that with Tom. Um, but I've also been um, interacting a lot with the physicists here, trying to say, can you help us understand some of these questions? And so it's been, um, it's been an unexpected and horrific, but also a very enriching journey for me here. Um, so the other caveat then is that I'm from University of Pennsylvania, so I don't live here. Okay? So I've been going out in the field with a local. Um, I anticipate that I may get a lot of questions. I'll do my best to answer them. But if they get specific about location, um, you know, I may have to either not be able to answer or just point to Tom, who's here. <laughs> so in question and answer, you, oh, you'll, prob you'll probably feel, you know, he'll probably field a lot of questions. So, um, But this is not a talk that is meant to be about a hazard talk, meaning um, we're not, it's not a talk about trying to figure out exactly what happened and how, but it is a talk about trying to understand what are the physics and the mechanisms associated with a kind of flow like this, and where are the most um, limiting pieces? In other words, what are the aspects of a flow like this that limits our predictability? Because this is sort of an area where frontiers in physics advances and then can actually help us understand such problems. And so I want you to understand that um, even when these landscapes like these hillsides appear to be doing nothing, right? We look up on a day like today, and they're sitting there not doing much. They are moving, but they're slowly creeping, right? And you don't see it because it's only happening at something like, you know, um, a meter per year. I can use a metric, right? All right, good. <laughs> well, sometimes I give really public talks, right? And <laughs> I have to try and do conversions in my mind. Um, but you know, you only see indirect evidence of this slow creeping motion. I have the example up there of fence posts bending and things like this. Sometimes you see foundations of houses getting cracked as they're slowly getting tilted by this kind of flow. So the soil is slowly creeping, but on human timescales, looks like it's behaving as a solid. And then something happens, be it a, a, an intense rain event like this, or an earthquake, or something like that, and this apparently solid-like material suddenly turns to a liquid 
and flows catastrophically. Right? And so landscapes like the Santa Ynez Mountains up there are really at the transition between creeping and flowing, and they're creeping most of the time, and they're flowing occasionally and catastrophically. And I just have this graphic up here. I may throw some jargon around. I try to limit the jargon that I use. But the term earth flow is a term that people use for slow landslides. And these are the ones that are creeping. In other words, you see them appearing as channels of soil that are you know, on a hillside, and they're moving at maybe a meter per year. Um, and these things that we call creep or earth flows basically cover a huge range of velocities. So basically when they're moving imperceptibly slow, we call it all creeping and it doesn't really affect us. When it liquefies and starts flowing fast, we give it a whole family of names, landslides, debris flows, avalanches, mudslides is not really a technical term, but it's one that is used by the public a lot. All of these kind of flows that are over here, they have different names if they're made of different materials. Some are mostly mud, some are rock, but these are the catastrophic fast-moving flows. And so one thing that I hope that you get out of this I'm going to move into in the talk later is that this transition from apparently solid-like but slowly creeping to fast-moving flows is really a, um, a frontier challenge in the physics of disordered materials, how materials that don't have a, a crystalline structure behave. And it's actually one of the primary problems that's being worked on on this program, the physics of dense suspensions that I've been a part of while I'm here. So stepping back, I just want you to, to understand if I go and I look at a mountain range, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity or randomness out in the world. There's different rock types of different strengths. So you, you can't take what I'm about to say literally down to the grain scale. But when I look at the shape of a mountain, it's not totally random, right? There's something about the shape of that mountain which is reflecting a balance of forces. And it's significantly more complicated, but a model, a not bad analogy would be to think of a mountain range as something like a pile of sand, right? And so if I keep slowly pouring sand, it will build up to some pile till it's steep enough that the gravitational force acting down slope overcomes friction and the grains will start to flow. And I can look at the angle of that hillside of that pile of sand and realize that it's an expression of a balance of forces, right? And landscapes are the same thing. And so that's another concept to keep in mind as we, uh, as we move through here. So this is a three times uh, vertical exaggeration, you know, topography draped on um, images or images draped on topography of Montecito. And so you can see the mountain ranges with the canyons coming up. This one is the San Isidro that I have there. A point that I want to make is that coming out of these canyons, and, and uh, I drew some drawings here on the side because I'm going to point to various, once I'm off this slide, I'm still going to be pointing to these ideas. So I may be pointing over here to my terrible perspective drawings. But basically, there's canyons. And we understand that canyons are eroding, right? And out of these canyons, when water and whatever sediment it's moving, be it mud or boulders or pebbles, comes out of those canyons, you can think of it as like your garden hose. And the water spews out of your garden hose. And when it becomes unconfined, it spreads and it slows down. And if that water is carrying dirt, you can imagine that as it slows down, that that dirt's going to settle out, right? And so when the flow comes out of these canyons, it spreads out similarly. And it dumps all the mud and the boulders that it's carrying. And it spreads them out over a broad area. We call that broad area a fan because it spreads out in a fan-like shape. And so I've just highlighted in blue the pointed edge is the, is the mouth of a canyon. And I've highlighted you know, generally the area of a fan. And in red, I've sort of just roughly drawn what a topographic cross-section would look like just to give you the idea that this landscape of Montecito is built by debris flows, right? So this is a very large and catastrophic event on human timescales. But we just need to remember and remind ourselves that these kind of landscapes were entirely built by these events. The fact that when you walk across any of these fans or you go over to Rocky Nook in Santa Barbara, you go to any of these places and you see boulders everywhere, really large size boulders, car sized boulders, they're all down there in that landscape because they were moved there, and they were moved there by the very same type of process that did this mudslide. Okay, um, so this is a landscape that's built by debris flows. Um, I, for a variety of reasons, um, not least which because it's it's still so um, sensitive and so painful. I, I'm not. I don't want to go into reliving the devastation that happened with this event. But 
Um, an unfortunate for science consequence of this event happening in the middle of the night is that we have very little direct footage even of this flow and how it happened, how fast it was, how big it was, where it went, right? And um, we've been trying pretty desperately um, to get as much information as we can. Tom um, and others here at UCSB have put out a call to the public to try to, for anybody that has any images or any videos anywhere. And so I'm going to put that advertisement out. If you have any pictures or any video or any anything of this flow as it was happening, you come find me afterwards, or if you know of anyone, um, because we're trying to collect this. And so the movies that I want to show here, I want to show you just because they're the few pieces of direct evidence that we have about what these flows look like. And if you've, if you've looked around on the internet or you've paid attention to the news, you've probably already seen these videos. You know, one of them is this um, really terrifying dash, you know, dash cam video from the police patrol car that basically drove, was driving down Olive Mill Road, answering an emergency call, and drove right into the debris flow. Um, and I want to show I want to show that video to you um, because I want, I want you to, um, what you can get a sense of is how fast that was. So sorry, I have to um, get this over here. There we go. Okay, did that work? Sorry, it's a, it's a two screen problem where I have to, so here we are. All right. So what you're going to see is this is a patrol car driving down Olive Mill Road, and you're going to see a little leading edge where it starts to get a little bit wet, and then it's going to get crazy, right? Um, Running down or up? Um, up, up Olive Mill Road. Up Olive Mill Road, okay. I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you see it's a little bit wet. It's a little bit wet, and now all of a sudden, the forward progress stops. The car does not sink. And if you pay close attention, so you see a lot of debris and trees, and you'll actually see a boulder right there floating, as if it's floating. There's a boulder that is on the surface of the water, not submerged, on the surface, and it moves by, right? So the, the, point, of this, the point I want to show you about this video is that a vehicle, a heavy vehicle, drove into this debris flow. And what happened to the vehicle is it did not sink, right? And the vehicle drove into the debris flow and it stayed not sinking and it was actually turned 180 degrees and spit back out the side. The car didn't turn around and go out the other side because they had any control at all. The debris flow did that. So now you realize, first of all, you learn a little bit of something, that the, the, the flow either was sufficiently dense that the car wouldn't easily sink in it and or the lift force on the vehicle from the fluid flowing was sufficient to stop it from sinking. You also realize that there's a very sharp velocity gradient at the boundary of this fan. So if you're trying to move, you know, at, at, so at the edge or at, at this flow, at the edge of the flow, it's not moving very fast and in the middle it is. That is the kind of velocity gradient that will give you a rotation that pushes the car back out. The other video that I want, so there's, there's just one other video that we have. Um, it's also on Olive Mill Road, and this is a rather famous one. Um, so none of these flows, I should say, by the way, are in the channel. So the, these flows are running over a road, right, and they're maybe this deep. The flows that were running in the channels had four, five meters on top of that, okay? So what we're seeing is not anywhere near the magnitude of the flows that was in the channel. This is just what was shunted off and went down a road. With that said, um, this is just to give you, this video gives you the idea of how abruptly the front passes by, right? So there's literally no flow, right? And then there's the, and then there's the, the floating wood that comes in front. Later, this guy runs into his house, and his house begins filling with mud. Um, and as Tom pointed out to me, you learn a few things. I'm going to show this video in a second, but his house fills with mud. In a couple minutes, it fills to a maximum height, and then it starts to drain. 
So we actually have a constraint on how fast the passage of at least this portion of the flow was. The other thing is he puts the camera on and shows the filling of the house with mud, and it's the first view we have that can give us an idea of how sticky or viscous this stuff might have been. And so that's what I want to show you here. Right? So here it is, overflowing, spilling into his house. Here it is, filled up to the kitchen counters. You notice here, if we go back, so it's, it's terrifying, and I, I, hate to, I hate to be so um, clinical about it, but I have to point out some things here that actually ha are, are, you know, do, in terms of forensic science are, are useful. He puts the camera and shows that his kitchen is filled to the countertops, but that mud is not moving. And he turns, which I'm going to show in a second, to where the mud is flowing in to the door, and you see it flowing at a good clip. And what you realize is this mud is flowing really fast, and right next to it is mud that is not moving at all. Now, if this was water, if you have a stream of water rushing by, the turbulence is going to cause a swirling motion such that inside here you would have motion. And so now we're, we're realizing that this mud is moving fast, but it is not turbulent. It doesn't have wildly varying turbulent motions. Rather, it's moving really fast, but it's rather viscous. And so I'm going to show you that again if you pay attention. This is not moving at all. And then over there is this torrent, right? So now, um, so now I'm going to go to my last video. Um, so we do not have a video, as I said, of this flow moving down the channel. And I'm going to show you evidence in a second about how we're reconstructing how big, how deep, how fast this flow was. But in order to calibrate you, I'm going to show you a video not from uh, the Montecito mudslide, but rather from a debris flow in, uh, in the um, Ilgraben, which is in Switzerland, right? They have a well-instrumented basin where these debris flows happen regularly in a channel, and they study them. But this the video I'm about to show you is the scale and the magnitude um, of the debris flows at Montecito, right? So here it is coming down. You notice car-sized boulders moving. Now you'll notice these boulders, the largest boulders are all staying right in the front, right? The largest boulders are in the front and they're actually either keeping the fluid out of them or they're moving faster than the muddy flow behind them in order for them to stay separated from the flow, right? And so there's this front of, of really, really large boulders that are almost eerily, mo slowly moving, right? It's almost eerie how slow they're moving and rolling. And you can get a sense as it goes over this falls, so there's all the big boulders, and now they're gone, right? Behind the boulders is an ocean of mud. Not that there's zero boulders in it, but I want you to understand that all the large boulders are all up in the front, and behind it is this ocean of mud. And so this debris flow actually is composed of this boulder-rich front with this fluid-like mud behind it. So if, let's see if... Uh, okay, it worked. Good. Okay, now we're back. So um, I want to walk you through um, where this material... I want to walk you through where this material came from. Um, so this is uh, walking upstream in San Isidro Creek. Um, this is actually looking at a little tributary, so a small channel that's coming in. So we're looking upstream. San Isidro is here. And of course, we know that there was a fire. We know that the, the Thomas fire, we know that the hills were burned pretty badly. And when you look at those burned hillsides, I mean, most of you probably have some idea that that's where the mud came from. Um, I want you to start noticing, though, as you start looking at those peaks, that there's little channels in those peaks. Um, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll show them in a second. But when you look at these burned hillsides, they're burned, but they're not featureless. They actually have these tiny, they're dissected by these tiny little channels. This is a better look at them. Um, so this is a picture right here with Tom, done for scale from the 12th of February. And we're, we're, we're walking up a tributary to San Isidro Creek. And here is the creek bed. And we're looking up, and you see all these things, these little channels we call rills, that are 
it cut in the landscape. So these rills, there's a layer of ash. Um, so after the fire, there's a loose layer of soil, which is, of course, the primary soil that is there that is burned and a lot of ash that's in it. All the organic materials, so the, the, the plant roots and everything else are all burned in this layer. And because all of that organic material was burned, you have this porous, loose layer that has a lot of ash in it. So the rills sawed down through that ash layer until they hit the, uh, the undisturbed soil underneath. And these rills were cut. I mean, you know, the, the, the most intense rainfall happened in about 10 minutes. These rills were probably cut in that time scale. So in 10 minutes, the hillside went from being barren to being dissected by thousands of these little rills. Um, this is just showing actually a picture um, that we, we went up there earlier this week, but this is showing a picture on um, the headwaters of uh, Cold Spring. And you see in the late afternoon light, all of these shadows here on the one side, all of those lines that look like somebody scratched the side of the hillside are all of these rills. And so the rainfall eroded these rills and it was those rills became channels of mud that were like little fire hoses shooting it straight into the channel. So that's the mud. The boulders, um, just to make one thing clear, there's a lot of questions and a lot of stories about the boulders. Um, the boulders that actually made the front of the debris flow, they came from the channels. And you know, if you look in if you look in the channels now, so this is right this is right near that picture where you saw those rills. This is looking upstream. It's a little sun bleached, but you see those boulders right there. These are a couple meter scale boulders that are in the channel. So slowly the hillsides are eroding, the rock is weathering, and boulders get liberated from that and they tumble down. And basically for hundreds of years these boulders are just accumulating slowly in the bottoms of the channels. And so the boulders that made the debris flow didn't come from landslides or anything else like that. They were in the channel waiting to be mined. They had accumulated there slowly and the, the fire jets, you know, like the fire hose jets of mud that came screaming down just plucked them and picked them up. And there's going to be some, after the, there will be a little bit of physics after the show and tell, but the show and tell is important for setting, for setting the stage. Um, you know, I didn't see any of these canyons before the mud flows happened. Um, many of my colleagues have, many of you probably have, but I didn't. Um, the aftermath, if we're, if we're in these canyons, so by in the canyons I mean we're up in the mountains before we're down here on the fan, right? We're up here in the canyons, up in the mountains, so steep valley walls. These canyons are ripped apart, right? And, you know, you, the pictures that I've seen, we have vegetation going all the way up, you know, to the edge of a nice, pleasant little channel. That's all been blown out um, really wide, right? And so um, there's a little bit of flow in the picture right there that you can see, um, a little trickle down there. That's just because of a ruptured water line. But I just want to make the point that the channel got really blown out. And by blown out, I mean it got eroded and material got excavated from the channels up in the canyons. A lot of the material that got excavated that was, that was in these places was previous debris flows that were just you know, sitting there in the channel waiting to be mined. Um, but the trees were cleared out. Um, I had made the point here. So now I'm saying that we were up in the canyon. Now we're at the top of the fan. And so by top of the fan, remember that the canyon you can think of as being like inside of your hose where everything's just rushing through. And then you can think of the top of the fan as being right where the flow first exits that canyon and becomes unconfined, right? And so here is the top of the fan. So this is, meant, this is my terrible drawing meant to show that the canyon's coming to an end and the flow is starting to spread out. So because the flow loses confinement by these steep valley walls, it starts to spread out. And as it starts to spread out, it starts dumping its material. The boulders... They, there's a lot of variability in the way that the boulders are deposited. But the first order picture is that the largest boulders got deposited right when the flow spread out when it left the canyon on the top of the fan, right? And so this here um, is in the Glen Oaks neighborhood where there's this really chilling boulder field, right, that, that is there. Um, and that's a boulder field that was left behind by the debris flow and the mud moved, kept right on going. A lot of times... And you, you see this in several places. You imagine that video that I showed you, that it was this phalanx of boulders in the front with mud behind. A lot of times something happens, 
The flow spreads out here like at the top of the fan or it encounters a bridge. The boulders deposit, but you've got this ocean of mud behind which basically hops over its own deposit or spills out around its own deposit and keeps right on going. And that's what happened here. Um, you've probably seen... Um, here we go. You know, you've probably seen pictures of this or walked around and experienced this sort of thing, that, but just in case you haven't... Um, you have car-sized boulders. And so these car-sized boulders were capable of crushing cars and other things like it. These boulders, to, to, you know, to piece together that these boulders were behaving like that video from Switzerland I was showing you, you, know, you can see that boulders were moving with sufficient momentum that they literally punched holes through houses. Right? And so this is just to give you an idea about at the top of this fan, the, the, kind, of, you know, the kind of momentum that these boulders were moving with. As we go down from the top of the fan to the bottom of the fan and you start to lose these boulders, what you end up with what, and what you see, what we see evidence of when we get further down on the fan is there's not very many boulders around anymore. There's a lot of mud, right? And we see these mud lines on houses. We see, um, you know, anywhere from, from, you know, tens of centimeters, um, you know, around tens of centimeters of mud deposition in places. And this is just to make the point to give you a qualitative idea about this mud and that it contains a lot of fine grain material. Um, when, we, when I first showed up there with Tom, um, you know, three weeks after um, the flow had happened, the mud was still wet, right? So this has sufficient clay material in it at least to still be moist or wet even three weeks after being deposited. Of course, we're doing quantitative analysis now to figure out what this stuff is made of in terms of its composition and its size. So we're trying to do this forensic science of figuring out how big and how fast this flow was so that we can eventually try to understand how it was made. And we don't have this, you know, because we don't have these direct observations. Um, and as I said, a lot of it is being cleaned up. And so a lot of what we have to do in order to do this is, is kind of low tech, right? So the first thing you notice when you start walking around in all these flow areas is that there's mud lines everywhere. And you don't need to look at it too long to even see that there's a structure to these mud lines. And by mud lines, I mean like here on this tree that Tom is pointing at it, that you look and you can see that near the channel, the mud lines are very high. And you can even notice that if you're looking at it, you know, if, if the channel's flowing that way, and you're looking in cross section, that the mud lines on the trees and houses go down and they taper as you go toward the edges, right? So you have this um, feeling, you have this sense, which you can quantify even, that the flow was something like this, right? So there's a channel in the middle, right? And the flow was moving through the channel, but it was also, of course, spilling over the channel. And you can reconstruct shape of this thing for the mud lines that are there. So that's one way for us to estimate the depths of these flows. Another one, this is an example of um, a graduate student standing underneath of a bridge. And the top of that bridge sustained damage from boulders colliding with it. And so the top of... Well, I mean the top of his head, the bottom of that bridge, and that was 3.8 meters, so about 4 meters. So the flow was up to 4 meters deep, and the boulders were at the top, right, banging into the top of that bridge. Um, and here is just a mixture of mud and gravel that is draped on top of a boulder. The boulder's about 1.5 meters, and that's sitting 3 meters above the channel. And it's got, you know, mud and gravel deposited on the top of it. So you start putting together numbers of four, five, in some places where it got confined, six to seven meters depth of flow here, right? So um, truly, truly staggering kinds of flows. So to put this together um, about, you know, about thinking about the, um, the sources of material we have, and sorry, my, this started happening yesterday, Lars. It was only yesterday. My computer started acting sluggish. So... Um, so putting this piece together, here's this exaggerated, um, you know, exaggerated topography again. Way up in the headwaters where we had these intense rains on the hillsides is where the mud to sand material was generated in these rills that cut down in minutes and were pumping mud into the channels. Um, that kind of flow encountered boulders that were in the channel and started picking them up 
as the flow then bulked up, so it had mud, and it was picking up boulders, and it became heavier, and it had boulders that started acting like battering rams, it bulked up and started eroding any debris flow material that was left from previous flows in these channels. So it scoured or eroded the bed, in some cases, a couple meters. And then, as we came out, as the flow came out of the canyons and onto the top of the fan, that's where the deposition started. Right? And we started depositing boulders first, and then smaller material, and then eventually just mud. So this is the story that we have right now. Um, I've presented you qualitative evidence. We have some quantitative evidence, too. So the conceptual model that we have, right? and I, is, is this drawing here is that by the time this flow came out of the canyon, the flow that hit the fan was like that video that I showed you from the old Graben and that it had this bouldery front with this kind of ocean of mud behind it. Um, I'm going to talk about how we get numbers in a second, um, but just focus on the drawings first. So in three dimensions, and this is, a, um, this, you know, this is the image I, I forgot to attribute to Nico Gray, um, but we have this, you know, in three dimensions, you have a flow that creates its own boundaries, right? So the flow is ripping down the channel, but it's, flooded out of the, it's flooding out of the channel. It's segregated so that it has boulders in the front and mud behind it. And so this is a fluid granular flow that makes its own boundary. The diameter of these boulders, I have order a meter, just because that's the most common size for the big boulders. But as we know, they get bigger. Depths of up to four meters, velocities of five to 10 meters a second. I'll show you some, some uh, way that we estimated this. It's actually 10 is really the number that keeps coming up. So you can think of that as like 20-something miles an hour. Um, and I say stress carried by the grains. What I really mean is that this bouldery front part was a granular flow. It was big particles banging into each other, probably as if the fluid wasn't even really there. You know, you, There's sufficient momentum from these boulders that they're providing collisional stress to each other through banging together. And behind it is this viscous... Um, is this dense sedimenting suspension, which we would call the mud flow. And by sedimenting, I just mean for the physicists in the audience, often they make suspensions by putting particles in a fluid, but they're neutrally buoyant. These are sedimenting, I just mean they're more dense, that if there wasn't anything keeping them, shearing them and keeping them going, they would settle out. Right? And so the diameter of the particles in there, are typically there's some gravel, but it's mostly sand-sized and smaller. It's moving at the same depth and the same velocity, we think, because they're moving together. Um, but the stress is carried by the fluid, and what I really mean, and the anecdotal evidence I showed you so far, is that this muddy part is behaving like a viscous flow. It's behaving like a viscous fluid, like molasses or honey or something like that. Um, and the question becomes, how, at least the question for us that we're trying to answer scientifically, is how do we create this flow? Once you have this flow, it's pretty apparent that it's going to be devastating. You can understand that if you have a flow that is deeper than the channel with boulders in the front and mud behind it, that it's going to flood, that it's going to do this kind of damage. And so how do we make this kind of flow in the first place? So I just want to point out um, that the debris flows that came down the channels were not a landslide. And it, it, it's not just a semantical um, point that I'm making. What I mean to say is that sometimes you get an intense rainfall, soil fails en masse, and you have soil and chunks of rock that move down the slope as a discrete body. That's a landslide. And it hits the channel, and it gets pumped up with some water, and it keeps right on going. And so sometimes you have a debris flow that comes down a channel because a landslide was triggered somewhere up high. That's not what happened here. What we actually had you know, is more like this, right? So we had we had rain falling on these hillsides and the rain eroding material essentially starting right from the ridge and eroding and picking up material at a rapid enough rate that it became, the concentrations got so high that it became a, a viscous flow. And so there's this mud, sand, gravel suspension that was formed by runoff from the hill slopes or the hillsides. That's what happened here. And so even though it happened within 10 minutes, you, the point I want to make is this was a continuous event. So in the 10 minutes when it was raining intensely, there was continuous erosion and cutting of these rills and continuous injection of mud coming from these rills into the channels. So the setup for this, um, 
most people have heard a fair bit about, and we know that the Thomas Fire has something to do with it, right? And um, in particular, um, for us, the fact that we created a, very, a compositionally very different kind of surface soil. And so um, because it's talked about and it's raised all the time um, and it's repeated in the news so often um, about the presence of this hydrophobic layer that may have helped things because, I mean, hurt, but I mean helped make a, you know, a debris flow so catastrophic. You know, there's, there's been this idea proposed and observed in many places, which is that if I get an intense fire and I burn up all the plant material, the plants have some waxy material on their leaves and their roots and it volatilizes when it burns. And the portion of that volatilized waxy material that diffuses into the ground cools when it gets deep enough and makes some waxy layer at depth. Right? And the idea is that this is now this waxy hydrophobic layer, which is at some depth beneath the surface, and so that it rained and the rain tried to infiltrate, but it could only get down through the ash layer until it hit this waxy layer and it couldn't get any further and that that created, um, you know, that contributed significantly to the erosion. That is a, that is a very commonly observed um, phenomenon and I don't want to make the argument that there wasn't any waxy layer or that it didn't have anything to do with this, but I do want to point out, and I just, I got a picture from my colleague Doug Burbank here that I didn't have time to work into here, so I just have my cheesy drawing that I made before. But um, there's this ashy, porous layer right here from the burn. If you walk around in this landscape, you stick a shovel into it, you realize that underneath of this is consolidated soil, you know, pretty dense soil, with unburned fibrous roots in it. So I just want to make the point that you have a big contrast from really porous to not very porous, and we have rainfall rates of you know, what was it, Tom, the 75 millimeters an hour? I mean, it only happened for 10 minutes, but some insanely high rate. If you have that much rain falling and you have a permeability contrast like this, you don't need to invoke any special thing like a hydrophobic layer to start getting massive erosion. This, this would have filled, you can do the calculation, it would have filled this little surface area up to the brim and it would have been overflowing everywhere. And so we don't have strong direct evidence for such a hydrophobic layer, but just in case... You know, I just want to make the point that whether or not it was there, with how catastrophic this rainfall was, you don't need something like that in order to imagine that you would fully saturate the surface layer and make it start to erode. Um, so, you know, how intense was the rain? So this is not this is not generated by me. This is a group from San Diego, but you know, we have radar, we have radar data. What is it? Every five minutes, I think, you know, down to very small little pixels showing the rain bands moving through this area. We also have tie stations on the ground, which are these rain gauges. And look at those rainfall intensities. So this one goes, what is that, up to 0.8 inches. So this, the unit is in inches, right? So it was 0.8 inches in, these are in 15-minute um, intervals. This is almost an inch in 15 minutes. If you look at these rainfall graphs, it looks like a delta function almost, right? There's very little lead up. It's just Bam, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of really intense rain, and then it goes, okay? And so this is the kind of flow that generates a flash flood, right? So you, you put a flow like that on a landscape, and it gets routed, it erodes these rills and gets routed down the channel, it will make a bore. And so by a flash flood, I mean that you could have a situation where literally the channel is dry, and the flood is coming as a wave moving over dry channel ground, right? And we don't have hydrographs for the channels in Montecito. Tom's trying to calculate them based on what we know from the rainfall. So I'm just showing you from another river, showing what you know the discharge moving down a river from a flash flood, just to give you an idea of the magnitude that you can have a river with literally no flow in it, and in a minute or two in these flash floods, right, it can the flow can shoot up immensely. So this is this is the intense rain that triggered everything. The, the point that I want to make about, um, we're up on the hillsides here, and so you have to make the mud flow part of the debris flow on the hillsides. And I can walk you through the evidence we have for that, but basically when you're up in the canyons, by the time you're in a channel, it's a little canyon, way up in the hills, there's a mud flow maybe this deep to this deep that had already moved boulders that were two meters in size. Okay, so 
it couldn't possibly be the case that clear water or even muddy water came into the channel and then got more got more bulked up. They had to be fully formed, you know, vis, you know, high concentration mud coming into the channels. And so, if you look at that, if we look at these hillsides, we see these rills again. And there's a, there's another picture right there where you can see them cu- scraping down. These rills cut almost all the way to the ridge. So if we're looking at this drawing here, I mean, here's the channel down here. Here's the top of a mountain or a ridge that separates one basin from another. And these rills come all the way up almost to the top, which means that we were able to start eroding with very little accumulation of water, right? I mean, if I'm standing right on, the, right on a ridge, right on a divide, I can't accumulate any water because every drop flows away from me. And as I go down, right, as I go down and down and down the valley, I accumulate more and more water. So this rainfall was able to erode with almost no water accumulation. The other thing is that we start to see, I have a little cross-section sketched out there in red, is that these rills were not purely erosional. They eroded in the middle, but they have little levees deposited on the edge. That means that these rills are basically formed by a viscous flow feature. The point I want to make is that these rills were actually debris flows. In a sense, they were miniature versions of what happened downstream. In the middle of the rills, they were flowing and eroding, but the flows were overspilling the edges of the rills, and they deposited and made and made these lobes, right? And so, um, the sediment concentration that we expect to get in a situation like this, we know that as we make the slope steeper and steeper, that if we're eroding in with water, we can get more and more sediment coming out. I'll be totally blunt with you right now and say that it is a challenge for us to conceive of how we could produce solids at such a high content just at the bottom of such a short slope. We don't really have any good experiments or, or, or data from any other place to, 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 to help guide us on something like that. But these viscous flow features are telling us that we reached very, very high mud concentrations just over a distance of, in some cases, of tens of meters. So in terms of the, um, you know, in training boulders. So I have a force balance in words here. Um, not because I think you can't handle the equation, just because I don't want to get distracted with a whole bunch of terms that are in it that you know you, I might have to define. So uh, basically, imagine that we want to. So you might want to ask the question: Is it reasonable that these flows could pick up these boulders up in the canyons and move them downstream, right? And so we want to try to figure out: Is it reasonable, or maybe more to the point, what kind of flow do we need in order to be able to pick up boulders and start moving them downstream? And so. We imagine that we have boulders, so there's just a picture of a boulder in a canyon. This is not from Montecito, from somewhere else, but just to show you a boulder sitting in a smooth canyon. And you imagine that simplified case, and in the top right, you imagine that boulder sitting there, and a flood wave comes. And as that flood wave hits the boulder, and we want to ask, what are the forces acting on that boulder at the moment that that bore comes and hits it? So there's a drag force, of course, associated with the flow hitting the particle, there's the downslope component of gravity, because these are 15% slopes in some cases. Um, there's potentially a lift force on the particles, although if the flow is shallower than the boulder, then there isn't. Um, but I just put it in there for completeness. And in addition, there's an impulse term. And the impulse term is just the idea that the fact that the boulder is sitting stationary and a flow comes, and that boulder at the moment that the bore hits feels high flow on one side and zero flow on the other side, that's an additional impulse or body force. It's like if you're in a canoe and you go into a portion of the channel that gets narrower and the flow speeds up. You feel an acceleration as you move through a spatially varying velocity field. Right? So this is the force balance. If we look at the density of the boulders or any kind of sediment, sand, silt, and clay, it's about 2,600 kilograms per meter cubed. The point is, is that boulders or mud or sand, the particles that make it up are about two and a half times as dense as water, clear water. But if you have a mud flow and densities, you know, concentrations people typically report are like 60% solids. So if you have a mud flow that is 60% solids, you double the density. So now if you're thinking about the buoyancy factor on these grains, that they're two and a half times as dense as clear water, you know, they're only marginally more dense, 30% more dense than a mud flow. So if you double the density, you actually, you actually reduce the, uh, you know, the, the effective weight of the particles by a huge amount. And so basically, what you come up with is that mud reduces the, cr- the depth of this wave. It reduces the critical depth that you need to entrain a boulder by three times, just the density 
And then you might lubricate the um, you might lubricate the base of the boulder with the bed, which reduces the friction. You know, roughly a factor of two could be more. You put these things together, and what you realize is that the force balance tells you that these flows will, could be capable of moving a boulder. Flows that are a tenth the size of the boulder could move the boulder, right? So I could potentially have a 10 centimeter mud flow that is capable of entraining a one meter boulder. So this is, we think that the, and we have evidence, not of that exact number, but we have evidence of thin flows up in the canyons moving big boulders. And so these flows were capable of picking up boulders even in the smallest channels all the way up there. Um, another thing, by the way, is that because of this density difference, if you imagine this boulder in this viscous mud, um, you basically double the effectiveness of the lift force acting on these particles because their density is reduced. And so just the hydrodynamic lift force we calculate should be sufficient to literally raise the boulders up to the surface of the flow. So, okay, so we have mud. We have mud and we have boulders. The mud entrained the boulders, but how do they segregate? And so this is a movie right here showing, uh, this is a, um, a field experiment. So it's a controlled experiment, but outside rather than inside of a released debris flow that is made of cobbles and gravel and a little bit of water. And basically that thing, that debris flow came down a chute, it was released onto a flat surface and you saw it flow out and spread. And this thing that played down here is just the velocity field. So it's the, just to show you that it's flowing fastest in the middle, slows down and that the flow actually freezes at the edges. When it spreads out enough, you know, there's friction, this material effectively has a yield stress. And so when the flow spreads out, the edges can actually stop. And so we know, so we want to we wanna think of, we have mud, it's picking, it's picking up boulders. How did it segregate into being discrete boulders in one place and mud behind it? Well, we know that granular flows segregate, and I have the Brazil nut, uh, you know, I have the mixed nut picture up there because the famous term in granular materials is the Brazil nut effect. You know, that basically you take a container of mixed nuts and it gets shaken, and the big Brazil nuts come up to the top, which is good because they're nasty and you can pluck them out and <laughs> get rid of them, right? And, you know, and people have studied this experimentally, and we know that vibrated and sheared granular systems will segregate by size. So that if, I, if I'm shearing or shaking a granular material, the big grains will move up to the top. And if I have a shearing flow where the velocity is fastest at the top, if the big grains go to the top, they will move to the front the fastest, right? And um, if you're curious, we can talk about some of the physics of that, but I'm not going to get into it here just to say it's a well-known granular phenomenon, and it produces fronts and levees of large grains. And by the way, every time you see this image here, it's because I'm now moving into the physics part of the talk, and it's not going to last much longer, don't worry. Um, <laughs> and for real though, every time you see this image is because the topic that is on the slide is actually a topic that is actively being um, worked on in the program that I'm a part of right now at the Kavli, right? And so I want to show you actually in a direct way, the correlation between the physics of the debris flows that we want to understand and the, and, the, and the physics of granular and suspension materials that's being studied here right now. So, 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 okay, granular materials can segregate things. However, if I just have fluid, liquid, and particles, they will phase segregate too. So in the top left is an experiment that if I just let glycerol and glass beads run down a slope, they will segregate so that the glass beads will move to the front if I put kaolinite, like, so clay water suspensions with marbles inside of a drum and I rotate it, they will phase separate so that the marbles go to the front. And in, in laboratory experiments that simulate debris flows where mud has been released with gravel, the same thing happens. And in that situation, it basically is that if I have a liquid and I have particles, if the combined effect of drag plus gravity downslope is greater than the velocity, the tendency of the particles to settle and deposit, I can have particles phase segregate. One question for us then is, is the debris flow a dense granular flow or is it a phase separating liquid solid flow, right? Um, we actually don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll be upfront about that and we know that both flows can segregate. So that's one thing that we want to try to understand, but at least qualitatively we get that no matter what happens, we're gonna phase segregate. So if we think about the boulder front, think of it as a, the boulder front itself is a granular flow like this. So this is from Nico Gray who presented a lot of this material um, to us. Um, 
this, you know, this program. And so this was a granular flow moving down a chute, impinging on an object, and you saw how fast it was moving, and it hits the object, and it splashes. And so here, you can think of this front as moving um, as a wave. And so if it's moving as a wave, we know that there's a dimensionless number that constrains how fast shallow water waves will move, and that's the Froude number. And so if it's moving, we know the Froude number was order one, not exactly one, but order one. And the Froude number is just the speed of the flow divided by the speed at which a wave can propagate, right? And so Froude number is one because we think it was propagating as a shallow wave. So square root gh, g is gravity, and h is the depth of the flow. So we think the Froude number was one, which gives us, for the range of depths we have, a range of velocities of these flows, that they should have been five to 10 meters a second. We can try to understand the characteristics of, the, of these flows. So a few dimensionless numbers here. We look at the collision Stokes number. This is just looking at particle inertia. So the, you know, the, the density, the relative density of the particle, its size or diameter and its velocity divided by the viscosity of the fluid. You get a huge number. Okay, so the, 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 the boulder fronts, if we put in the size of these particles and how fast they were moving, they didn't care about fluid viscosity at all. And that indicates that, it was, that the boulder front should have been behaving like a dry granular flow. Uh, there's another dimensionless number that at this program we like a lot, uh, this, this uh, um, number i. And basically we, we use this number i because we know that the friction of a granular material depends on this dimensionless number i. But it's basically a ratio of um, the, 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 the amount of shear that the particles experience from flowing divided by the confining pressure. So you, you imagine that if the particles are shearing and bouncing on each other really fast, they make this kind of dilute granular gas or if they're being pushed on really hard and they're moving slowly, that they're really dense and in strong frictional contact, right? And so this is a number that characterizes the behavior of the flows. And this number, one, you may not be calibrated, but that's pretty high also. So it says that this was a collisional kind of, um, another way of saying that this is a collisional kind of flow. If we go to the mud phase, um, oh, I don't know what happened there. So if we look at these same dimensionless numbers, well now for the Stokes number, we have 10 instead of 10 to the 6. For i, we have 10 to the minus 4 instead of 1. This is just to make the point that the, the, the collisions were viscously damped and that this was a strongly frictional kind of flow. So if you, do the, if you do the thing, you consider the mud as a viscous fluid with a yield stress, you calculate its viscosity, and you calculate, and you know, the viscosity should have been something like honey. If you calculate the Reynolds number, which just tells you the inertia of the flow compared to viscosity, it gives you a number of about 100. It says this was a laminar viscous flow. However, I need to make a, a caveat here, is this is assuming that the flow has one viscosity. And I'm showing all these movies from, from cornstarches that one thing that we know is that fluid particle materials don't have one viscosity. They are shear thickening, where their effective viscosity grows the harder you shear them. And the reason that I bring that up is that we calculate that the viscosity of these flows at full depth should have been something close to that of honey, and yet, that doesn't really jive with your experience if you poke at mud and it seems to flow really easily. But that's, you know, one thing we know now is that mud belongs to this class of materials that strongly shear thickens. So it's very liquid-like when you poke it a little bit, but when you shear it really hard, it becomes solid. And so I'm just showing you movies from Heinrich Jaeger and his group of cornstarch, and this is the extreme example of a material that shear thickens, where it really behaves like a liquid when you poke it, but then you can run on it and it becomes solid. And I'm missing the little, uh, you know, cobbly icon there. This, uh, this it got covered up by something, I don't know what. But this, this shear thickening behavior has been of immense, immense interest because it's such a fundamentally noticeable behavior of all fluid particle systems, and there's still so many things that we don't know about it. So just, just to calibrate you, though, um, so if we're looking at fruit number about one, and we're looking at Reynolds number, so inertia of the flow compared to viscosity about 100. And you want to have an idea of what kind of flow is this like. A good analogy would be, you know, I'm an experimentalist, but I'm here visiting at KITP, and I couldn't bring my lab with me, so all I have is the kitchen sink. Um, right? But if you let your faucet run down on, you know, let the water run down on the ground, and it spreads, the flow spreads out really rapidly, but as it spreads out, it slows. And at some point, it slows enough that waves can propagate faster than the flow spreads out and you get these kind of standing waves, right? And so this kind of flow right here, this sheet flow of the water spreading out in the bottom of your sink, is about the kind of flow that we imagine that this mud was like. And if you stick an obstacle into a flow like that, 
What happens if you can see this vague trace of this wet line is I stuck an obstacle into that flow and the water hits it and it runs up it, right? It splashes up the side. So, of course, this happens at larger scales. A bridge abutment there on the left or a, or a laboratory experimental flow. If we have flows that are, that are, are moving as waves, as, as shallow waves, fast enough, they're moving forward and when they hit an obstacle, all of their forward energy is translated into moving vertically, right? And so, if that's the case, that the flows were moving so fast that they essentially didn't slow down as they approached an object, but they just hit it and turned all their forward momentum into vertical, you can calculate how high of a splash they should make. So if we take the flow velocities of 10 meters per second, so u squared over 2g, you say for a 10 meter a flow, 10 meter second flow, I should have heights of these jets of up to 5 meters. And you say, do I really have splashes up to 5 meters on these trees? Here's Tom's wife for scale trying to measure the top of a mud flow, which is more than double her height. We actually see splashes on the upstream side of trees that are four and five meters high regularly. And if you walk around in, in these places, you'll see that the upstream facing side of the trees is covered with mud up to sometimes like almost the height of the ceiling, and the back end is not, right? And that's, that's for this reason. So I'm getting close to the end. Um, but I just want to get you an idea in terms of the, the thinking about the mud phase and its rheology. I have here an experiment from my lab, which is a shear flow. So you're looking at a movie where the flow is going from right to left. And it's just a viscous oil is being driven and moving over the grains. And the grains are moving. And in this sped up movie, what I want you to get is just that the particles are dilute and moving really fast at the top. And they get dense and they're moving more slowly at the bottom. And so if you look at a flow like this, you know, of course, the velocity is fastest at the top and it decreases going down. But also importantly is that the particles are really dilute at the top where they're banging into each other. But as you go down and down and down into the flow, the concentration of particles gets higher and higher. Well, the one thing that we know going back to this idea of the rheology of fluid particle systems is that as I increase the packing fraction or the volume content, if I take a fluid and I start making it 30% solid, 40%, 50%, that the viscosity, which is here normalized by the, the viscosity of clear fluid, as you approach a critical value, it starts to shoot up immensely. So if we take our effective viscosity and we ask the question, what kind of solids content could produce a flow that was you know, 100,000 times as viscous as water, it had to be something approaching 60% solids. And so we can infer, based on everything I've shown you about how fast the stuff moved and how thick it was, we can infer its viscosity and then ask the question, how much solids do we need to pump in there in order to get viscosities that high? And so we have it pieced together that we have a flow that we created 60% solid mud flows on a hillside by the erosion of rills. As soon as those flows entered the channels, they already had sufficient energy to start picking up boulders and entraining them. They entrained boulders by mining them from the channel and they segregated them to the front. And that segregation probably made the flows deeper because now there's a dam of boulders in the front that the water ponds behind. The outstanding problem, and there are a lot of outstanding problems, but the, with a capital T, outstanding problem is the problem of liquefaction. Ultimately, I'm coming back to this question about how these soil granular materials transition from creeping to flowing. Um, we have some evidence from my lab and others that this transition actually kind of looks like what happens when you melt or shear a glass. Not just qualitatively, but it shares quantitative similarities, right? And one of the things that's been working on in this program is this idea that if I, what, what does a glass or a colloidal suspension or a debris flow have in common? It's that I have a disordered collection of particles. In a glass, the particles are atoms and molecules, but they can't form a crystalline structure, and it makes their transition from flowing to not flowing complicated and rich rather than simple and predictable. And now, we now have evidence that the creeping to flowing transition exhibits some uh, glassy dynamics. There's this shear thickening behavior, which pathologically can also be shear thinning sometimes. <laughs> okay, so it's not necessarily one way. But we have this shear thickening or thinning behavior. And the reason I have this movie here from Bob Berenger is that what he's doing is dragging an intruder through a pile of static grains, but you can think of it as being equivalently a flowing layer of grains around, around an obstacle. And everywhere that's lighting up in there, 
is areas where grains are experiencing more forces. And the point here is that if I have a collection of grains, when I push on it, they don't transmit stresses uniformly through the material. Rather, the fact that it's disordered, there are little granular, little chains of grains that are in more frictional contact and they bear the load. That makes things really complicated. On top of that, if there's cohesion, if these particles can attract to each other, then you can also have cohesive contact networks that are like these force, these, um, these force chains. And so these are all things that are, that, that, that are unknown and not understood, that, that we and others are working on right now, but that we need to understand in order to relate to this problem. And finally, there's, it's related to these other two is this problem of gradual viscous failure. So rather than, a, you know, the, the flow that we got in Montecito was catastrophic, but I've tried to paint a picture for you that was gradual in the sense that these were flows that were bulking up, becoming more and more viscous-like down the hillside rather than failing as a landslide catastrophically. That is an understudied problem. And besides all these other granular effects, there's effects like pore pressure and lubrication and other points of the material that we're just beginning to start to pull together into a coherent picture. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>
working to understand. So I can't give you a definitive answer, but that's what we're work that's that's the working hypothesis right now. Is there, is there anything unique that makes, that makes you particularly more vulnerable? I mean, the short answer is no, or if there is, it's probably things that we learn here that we should look for elsewhere. So there are lots of, you know, there are areas that experience debris flows pretty frequently, and there's a te- there are teams of scientists, that, you know, from various places that are trained to come in after an event like this, and they're trained because events like this happen in the West a lot. Um, that said... What we're, the problem that is understudied here is that these debris flows formed on the hillsides. It's not unprecedented. We think it's probably pretty common, but it's not been, it's not been documented very much in the scientific literature. Uh, looking at just the uh, practical consequences and predictability of future catastrophic events, when you have all of the variables that you've described so well, then there's so many things in those variables that are not so well understood, and yet you're you are uh, asked to predict future probabilities. The one thing that is relatively uh, constant that does have some predictive abilities is the steepness of the slope involved in the generation of the forces that create the flow. How much are you able to take that element specifically and create predictability for people living on variable slopes that have variable right, steepness? Right, right. So uh, I will, you know, I'll always... Uh, delicately state things like I don't make any predictions because I have no but I mean you know I have the luxury of working on the science like the scientific basic understanding side and I really really um, I have an immense amount of respect for the people that need to make decisions or hand you know hand solutions for people to make decisions I will say that um you know the way I think about to answer your question with a little bit of context is I think you work at this problem both ways so there's a purely empirical aspect about delineating hazard that actually, because we've been doing it for a long enough time, has a lot of value now, right? And so slope is one of the key factors, right? So intensity of burn and slope empirically are two of the critical factors that go into the hazard maps that have been made for this area and that were used with some, you know, with some fidelity to predict the most likely places to undergo, uh, you know, to undergo this kind of failure. So certainly when you get slopes much below 20 degrees, nothing happens. And we know that for this material. And I, and I would go even further and say the empirical predictions of risk, not of any one event, but of overall risk, I think are only becoming better and better as we get more data. So I think slope is a critical variable. And the only thing that I would say is that, you know, the problem with empiricism is you can't predict anything you haven't encountered yet. And so I think that the empiricism is needed and is getting better and better and will continue to grow. But I think from the basic science side, we need to work at it from the other end. You know, and they haven't met yet. And they're probably a long way away from meeting, right? So there's virtually no contact between what I've talked about and that empirical hazard prediction models, but we're hoping that there will be. As people are thinking about how to repair and rebuild after this event, and given all the, the scientific analysis you've done, what would you recommend in terms of the responsible way for anyone to think you, about doing you know that? you know I'm being recorded right and I'm a I just had my statement about being a scientist and having the luxury of not needing to do this um, I mean one thing one thing that I would one thing I will offer which is a way out I would recommend to pay very careful attention to what is being done in clearing out these channels so that's, that's a very narrow, particular answer. But what I mean to say is, and, and you know, Tom has made this point in talking to me, and, and I made the point then to, to you all, that there aren't, you know, there aren't very many boulders left in a lot of these channels, and it will take some time to accumulate them again. So I can say, qualitatively, that we expect it would be harder for something like this to happen again, and one will need to wait some amount of time for boulders to accumulate in the channels. On the other hand, we may have fewer boulders, but maybe we, get a, maybe we get a rain that's three times somehow as intense as this one, right? One thing is that um, you know, when you go out and you do work here, you realize that all of the, you know, the channels are being cleared out as they should be to try to increase the conveyance capacity. The question ultimately is, in a practical way, is what are, what's the design conveyance capacity? In other words, it makes sense to go dig out the channel. 
the thing to pay attention to is if we're digging out these channels lower on the fan that filled with boulders and mud, we want to dig them out so they can handle the next flood that comes along. What are we digging them out to? In other words, what is the design conveyance capacity of them? That's the best thing I could say is pay attention, try and figure out how much, how much information is actually going into the, the cutting out and redesign of these channels for conveyance capacity. Just a quick question. When you, when you say there are no more boulders in the channels, are you referring to boulders in the debris basins or in the canyons themselves? No, I'm talking, I'm talking about in the canyons. I'm talking about in the canyons. So, of course, there are debris basins that caught some of the stuff and they weren't big enough to, you know, they weren't big enough to catch all of it. Um, and, of course, they then get scoured out. You know, they then get, um, you know, uh, emptied so that they can work again. But so I haven't, no, I haven't, I didn't mean to imply at all um, that I'm talking about the debris basins. I actually mean the channels in the canyons that supplied all of the boulders. Yeah. And it's not that there's none, right? I mean, there's still some boulders that didn't get picked up. And in some parts of these canyons, there are debris flows that never made it all the way down that are sitting there. And so there's some boulders there, but just not nearly as many as there were before. Is but is there still a chance of a mud? I mean, okay, say there's a mud flow without a lot of boulders. Yeah. It's, the mud was still behind the boulders, so yeah. that had nothing to do with the boulders being there. So is there enough, is there enough mud up there to ha create more mud flows? Or, or, so, yeah. yeah okay, how does so that I'll say compute? two things. So first of all, there's plenty of mud. The question is whether it can be made into a mud flow, right? And so I think that there's a plenty of material there, but the point that Tom has made is that because we now have this, the rills were cut and they were cut deep, and we now have this enhanced ability of the landscape to absorb rain, there's plenty of sediment that could be made into mud, but it will not get as saturated as it would before. The other point is that, um, and this is, this is turned, I'll turn into a science question. One thing we're trying to answer is how, how deep would the debris flows have been if there were not boulders, right? So if you release a mud flow, the exact kind that I've described, but it has no boulders in it, would it be comparable or half in depth or would it be spread out? You know, the thing would spread out over much more space and be contained entirely within the channels. We don't know, but a feeling that, that Tom and I have is that a lot of this flow probably would have been mostly contained in the channels if there wasn't this boulder dam in the front of it. How, how localized was this uh, delta function deluge? And are there other canyons that were not experiencing that same intensity that might still be ripe for a similar event? Um, so I'm, I'm going to give, I, I'll, I'll give an answer and then I'll tell you, and then I'll ask Tom. But so what was it, Tom, was it f basically four, four channels that we know, that we know of that had pretty substantial debris flows and that were in that bullseye of the, of the rain? Uh, I think it's five, but it's the same, yeah. Uh -huh. but the, the answer to the question is that yes, to the east of us. Or as we call it here, south, but go down south now, 101. Um, there, are, there are many basins that burn and are therefore vulnerable to this initiation process that did not receive anywhere near the same intensity of rainfall that occurred on the 9th of January. So they could go if they were equally unfortunate to get a squall line going through like the one that was experienced here. Yeah. In this particular event, did the underlying soil characteristics make much difference or were they all so altered by the fire that, uh, that that was the key thing that created the soil that did this? Yeah, um, so uh, this is another question that Tom would be much better to answer than me, but I'll channel Tom, which is that, so, but we, I've, 
we go up in the field and everywhere that you're on the everywhere on the hillsides that are underlain by the shales are where the rills formed. And everywhere that is underlain by the sandstone, there's no rills. Right? So you gotta make mud. And the easiest way, you can make mud a lot of ways, but see I'm from the humid east. When I come out here I say, you know, these soils don't look like the meters deep, fluffy, organic, rich kind of stuff, right? But when you so when you go around here you realize that one easy way to make mud is this pardon my language, but crappy mudstone that's basically everywhere it's exposed at the surface is just falling apart into little chips. And so, yeah, I mean, all the, all, all the mud came from the area, you know, all the rills and all the mud came from the areas that are underlain by all the shales, by the mudstone. Yeah. How important is the fraction of ash that's a, a component in the mud? Um, I don't know. So, no, no, but it, it is a good question. It, it, so the question about, you know, how important is the fraction of ash? So, I mean, I think one of the most important things is, is simply that the soil became, um, you know, much more loose and fluffy. You know, when you walk around in the burned areas, you walk on the soil, it feels so loose and fluffy, like you sink into it. And so in that case, you know, the ashes you could think of as, is incidental. It's just where there used to be more mass, and now there's just less. However, um, the ash probably lubricates. So it's finer grained, so there's a granular lubrication that can happen. And in fact, lubricating grains with powders is one thing that's done in industry a lot, right? So you take the sand and you put ash around the edges, and it slides past each other. It also may have helped it, hold, you know, it also may drain, it, prob you know, it, it probably drains worse than if it were just sand. And so uh, to, the, to whether the, the main point of the ash was only that it was, is incidental, that really it's reduced, you know, it's, it's make creating voids was the dominant factor, or whether the ash actually lubricated and held on to water also and made it flow more and bulk up more, we don't know, but it could have happened. That, that's, about, that's about what I can say right now. Okay, well, let's thank Douglas. <laughs>